We are live. Hello to Jennifer Hi. Wolf Cam. Can Hi. I call you Jen? Yes, please. And uh, we are celebrating a wonderful picture book that you've recently published called Until the Blueberries Grow. Um, it's one of those rare books that brings tears to my eyes. And I'm not being facetious. I really cried when I wrote it. Uh, I'm so honored to have you here on the uh, program. Um, I should mention that I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I'm here, <laughs> the host of the Children's Literature Channel on the New Books Network. So welcome to the show, Jen. Thank you so much, Mel. I'm so honored to be here. I'm so excited. I enjoy your interviews very much. So I'm really just thrilled to be one of them now. So okay, thank you. Okay, so enough of that. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna put you to work. Okay. Tell us everything. Tell us all about yourself. Start at the beginning. Okay, the very beginning. Um, <laughs> so no, I not, am... not, not, not necessarily the conception, but you know, <laughs> soon afterwards. I don't know about that anyway, so we'll pass. Um, so I am from I am from New York. I've lived here my whole life. I live on Long Island. Um, except for a few years when I went to school in Boston, I have been here. And um, I've really been writing my whole life. I have always been scribbling and I was one of those little kids who would put together these illustrated stories on construction paper, staple them together and bring them to school and read them at circle time, which may or may not have been annoying, but I was encouraged to do that. My teachers were all really supportive. So I was always doing that. Um, and I grew up in a house where everybody read, particularly my mother. My mother is a retired um, English language arts teacher. She taught sixth grade. And as early as I can remember, we would go to the library every week, take out books. And it was always so exciting to see what we would come home with. And very often, I'm actually, I was a repeat offender of returning books late because I never wanted to give them back. Um, but I just- I, Are you one of these people- that owe the New York library system $30,000 in overdue books? Well, maybe my mom does, but I don't, <laughs> personally. So you took out uh, a lot of I, books. I used to take out a lot of books, yeah. So I just always loved reading. And I, you know, I wrote throughout element, elementary school. And actually, um, I wrote my first novel in my eighth grade woodshop notebook, which now everybody knows. But um, I actually have it here. I can show you. Wood, wood, shop, um, wood shop? Wood shop? Wood shop. So like bandsaw, hammering, nailing, like building things. So I was how, supposed- how, I was how, doing, how much wood would a wood shop shop? Right, exactly. And I don't know because I was writing a novel in my book. So this is it. I have this. This is from eighth grade. And you can see on, I don't know if you can see. So like on the first page, I took very diligent notes on how to use a T-square ruler. Did some other notes here, you know, very nice. But then this is what the rest of the, this is the what the rest of the book looks like. I took no more notes. This is all my novel in my handwriting from eighth grade. So don't ask me to build anything, but- um, I, I think you're very novel. clever, realizing that the best use of woodwork is paper. Obviously, thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. So yeah, so that was kind of how I got started. And um, then I just have always been writing. And um, I, I, I tried for a number of years when I was first out of college. Um, I would write at my desk at work, which now everybody knows I was doing that instead of working. But um, I did do work though. And I eventually- well, What kind of work? So I, I was a clinical psychology major at Tufts University. And I was all set to go to graduate school. And then I decided I wanted to take a few years off because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I've always been interested in people. I'm a big eavesdropper. Um, so that, that, would, I, that would make you a great psychologist. Yeah, yeah, but I decided not to do it. I went into the business world and I worked for nine years in human resources. So I did that. That's what I did. Um, and then I, I did some freelancing at the time also, like on the side, magazines and things like that. And when my first son was born, I decided I was going to try to really make a go of writing. And so I, you know, I did, I joined lots of groups. I did a lot of research, um, went to conferences. How many years ago writing. was this? 
Well, now I'm going to age myself. No, you're just going to age your son. Right. About 20. Okay. So 20, you were 12 when you had him. I was 12. Early early 30s. Okay. Yeah, totally. Maybe younger. So, um, so I, you know, I, I started and I started to, you know, get to know other writers and I really just went all in, but you know, it's hard. Um, everybody has competing interests. People have jobs, people have families. Um, it's, it's hard to totally focus on that. So I decided, um, when I was pregnant with my second son to go back to graduate school and I applied to Vermont college of fine arts and went there for an MFA. Now I, I will say, I don't, you know, you don't need to have an MFA to publish. But for me, it was a way to really just put the whole idea of publishing aside and really focus on the craft in a structured, supportive way, and also find a community of writers um, in person. So I did that. And I, it actually took me three years, not two, because I went every other semester because my-, Je- my Jen, I have to ask you this question. Yeah. <clears throat> first, first of all, it's very prestigious. Vermont is a very prestigious school. Thank you. How it is. much- how much did this uh, Michigas cost you? <laughs> that I don't even know. I don't remember. But, but is, uh, it, is it cheap or expensive? I mean, I think that there are ways to make it more reasonable. Um, it's a cost. Look, it's a cost, you know, so it's no, not. So, I mean, you, you were putting your money where your pen is. Yes. And you like were I making said, you know, an investment. Yes. And for me, you know, it was really worth it. I think that people who go there will, will tell you that, you know, it's really amazing, but everybody has their own path and their own way to, you know, find their way in the world and to find communities. Um, and at different points in our lives, we can or can't do other things. So I was fortunate that at that point in my life, I was able to, you know, I was able to, you know, pay for it and, and do it and find the time. Although, like I said, I didn't, I didn't do it straight through. I did have to take a semester off in between each semester. And that, um, that was for, for me, that was the right way to do it. And I'm, I'm grateful. And I'm still very close with um, some of the people that I met there. Those were my earliest critique partners and friends in the writing world. Um, and so those relationships have continued. And the, the, the wider community is very supportive too. So- Okay, but, um, but, but when you, um... When you grew, grew growed up, okay. Did that happen? Uh, okay. Yes, okay. I, you know, two kids later and so on. Um, you you made a decision to be what kind of writer because you are like straddling two two mountains here. You're like you know you have one leg on either side of the Grand Canyon. You have yeah. like <clears throat> supernatural young adult books. Yeah with death and uh, who knows what else. And then you have this marvelous children's book we're gonna talk about in a moment. Yeah. So what what was your destiny? So I think if you talk to most writers, you'll find that they write a lot of different kinds of things. And that's always been me. I write middle grade too. I just haven't published any, but I have some middle grade novels that I would love to publish that are, you know, sitting on my computer um, and I'm working on uh, some of them. And I have, a lot more picture books that I hope will see the light of day at some point. So for me, I think um, initially, you know, I started with novels, but when I was at Vermont, I worked with four different advisors and I tried to focus on different genres and different types of writing while I was there because it was just this unique time in my life where I could really just focus about or, or anything. So, uh, so I did focus on, on novels, middle grade, YA, but I also worked on picture books. And um, one of my advisors, uh, Marion Dane Bauer was one of my advisors, which was amazing. And you know, her books are just incredible. Um, Kind of gave me some life-changing advice, which was your writing is beautiful, but I feel like I'm watching a movie. I'm not inside your characters. And she she told me, which seems obvious, but it wasn't to me, um, that you need to write from inside your characters you know, so that your, your, your readers go on the journey with them. They, they feel the world through them. They taste it, they touch it, they, they hear it. Um, and that I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I was just kind of like, you know, doing cinematic stuff, I guess, which was pretty um, and you know, lots of dialogue, but not really so um, internal. So I also, I started working on picture books with her. So that was kind of when I started with that. Um, well, let's let's, let's, let's hold, hold, hold that. I want, I want to stick with that thought for a moment. Yeah. 
-hmm. because it is profound in its uh, simplicity. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we teach the beginners and uh, sometimes ourselves that we have to know every detail about our main characters, yeah. what they eat for breakfast and uh, which direction they comb their hair, provided they have hair. Um, and, you know, I, and, and the students say, well, what's that all about? And, and, and here it's, it's so simple. So you simple. have to be, you have to live in your main character. Yeah. Wow. So it changed, it changed my writing. I will say that was, that was really the one <clears throat> thing that changed it profoundly, as you said. Um, so, but I've always loved picture books. Picture books were my first love. That's, that's where I fell in love with reading. Um, so I, I had been slogging through some novels and not really, I'm, I'm not a great plotter, full disclosure. I'm really not. I'm very disorganized in my head. So it's hard for me to kind of structure things. So it takes me a long time um, sometimes to kind of figure that out. But I thought actually picture books might be a great way for me to, to really kind of study arcs, story arcs, because you have to do it. You better do it quick. You don't really have a lot of words and you don't have a lot of space. And so I went to the writing barn in Austin, which I'm sure you know all about. Um, they're amazing. And Bethany is, uh, who runs it, is a dear friend that from Vermont College. So she's someone um, that I knew. So I went to a picture is, is, book. Is that, is that where you met the Susan Johnson Taylor who brought us together? Yes, that's where I met Susan, who's one of my critique partners. Okay. Um, we have an online critique group with a couple of other writers who we all met each other through the writing barn. Um, and I went there for an uh, in-person writing uh, boot camp for a couple of days, and it was exciting to be there in Austin live. Um, and I really, so I, I kind of switched gears and I started working on picture books, and then I wrote a whole bunch of them. So now I have a bunch that hopefully will eventually make their way out into the world. And um, but I just I like to write all different kinds of things. I don't really focus on. I like poetry too. You know, I I just and I and I've recently started blogging. I don't know. I don't know that anyone's reading it, but you know, I've been doing that and um, I just love to write. So I feel like when I'm struck with an idea or for me, it's more, I'm struck with a character, which might be why I have trouble plotting. Cause then I have to figure out what, what the story is. Um, but I, I just write. And sometimes it's a picture book idea. And sometimes it's for older readers. Okay. Well, you know, as somebody um, three times your age, who spent their lives not focusing. I once paid a lot of money to an advisor. Uh -huh. I said, give me some wisdom about my life. And um, after I paid him, he sent me this report that had two main uh, thoughts. Yeah. The first thought was focus. And the second was, uh, don't hire any more specialists like me because you're never going to focus. That's very funny. So he was actually a comedian. Yeah, but I mean, I paid him a, a lot of money to be serious. A lot of money, right? yeah. yeah. Um, so, well, I, interesting advice. So, so my advice is, uh, it's important to focus. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. That, yeah. you know, that's my two cents worth. Uh, as somebody who, who has only been able to focus the past five or six years. And even then, ah. anyway. So uh, let's uh, move forward mm -hmm. uh, to the blueberries. Yes, the blueberries. Oh. That's, a, that's a miracle. That's a miracle book. It just came out until the blueberries grow. Yes. And you, it want, to, comes you want to... It comes out May 1st. May 1st it comes out. But these are... Uh, it hasn't come out yet even. Oh, you're getting a sneak preview. It comes out we're, May 1st. Hey, we're coming out before the blueberries. Yes, you are. Yeah. For real. For real. You, can, yeah. you can pre order the book for Pesach. Um, actually, no, it's not available till May 1st on Amazon. Uh, yeah. And there is a Pesach scene in here. Are we talking about it? I know. So, I know. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so uh, Pesach, for the people who uh, aren't necessarily Jewish, it's Passover. Uh, for the people who aren't necessarily Jewish, which is the Jewish Easter <clears throat> or the vice versa. It's the Easter that was before Easter was. Right. But, but we're waxing theological here. Um, say that 10 times fast, the Easter before Easter was. Okay. I thought yeah. you wanted me to say theological fast. Um, <laughs> Jen, let, we're having too much fun. Um, so, so run me through this process. So you've, you've 
taken an awesome master's degree to Vermont and you've yeah. done the, the writing barn and you're writing bunches of books, but we both know the chance of being published uh, by PJ Library or any other traditional publishers is yeah. one, one in a gazillion. Yeah. So how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, not easily, obviously. Um, I think, you know, everybody hears about the quick deals and the multiple book deals, but I, again, I think you talk to most writers um, and most published writers, you'll see a much more, um, a much rockier journey. Uh, so my first book, which is a young adult, Supernatural Mystery, which I'll just show you briefly, but um, it's Which called was published by Charles Bridge. Yes, it was published by Charles Bridge. Um, Yay on that. Yeah, thank you. So this is a Supernatural Mystery. Um, that was published. I, I had actually had an agent for several years that I signed with. Um, so how, did you, how, did you, how did you find your agent after Vermont? Querying, querying. I was querying a different uh, book, but I, I found him and we had a nice... You know, but you were querying young young adults. You weren't querying yeah. picture books. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that, that's 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 the first piece of advice. Query. Don't, quer don't query picture don't books. Picture. <laughs> okay, so you were yeah. querying young adults. So I was, and I and you know everything was fine. We were together for a couple of years, but you know ultimately there were no sales, and we parted ways amicably. Um, and so then I was I was agentless, which you know, was, was rough and it was definitely anxiety provoking because it's very difficult, you know, to um, get your work in front of editors without an agent. Um, but then, so I entered a contest um, and I won. And so the prize was the, the contract with Charles Bridge. Wow. So that was, so that's how I got that. Um, and that you got that without an agent. Yeah, I did. Yay for you. Thank you. Um, so that, so yeah, and now I do have an agent. I have a wonderful agent um, who I signed with about a year ago. Um, Who's, whose name and, is? Uh, Christina Perez from Zeno Agency. And she is in London, which is one of my favorite cities. So that's coincidental, but it's actually also really exciting. <laughs> Although of course I haven't been since the pandemic. So. Um, yeah, but one day. So yeah, so, but this, but again, this book, I sold before I signed with her. And this is how uh, this went down was I again, entered a contest. So again, don't discount contests. Um, yes, I second, a, second piece second. of stage advice. Yeah, so enter contests. S enter contests. So SCBWI Jewish Stories Award that PJ Library sponsors, I well, with SCBWI. And I, I entered uh, this book and guess what? You won. I didn't win. I didn't ah. win. Yeah, I didn't win. And I was disappointed. But then I got a phone call from BJ Library saying, well, you didn't win, but we love your story. And if you're willing to revise a little bit with us, we would be interested in talking to you about publishing. So I like to say, sometimes when you don't win, you win, because I won. And I got the publishing contract and um, it's with uh, PJ Publishing, which is PJ Library's newer uh, publishing imprint. Um, and it's amazing because their distribution is incredible and the name is incredible. And just the, the people who work there are just amazing. I'm starting to, you know, my editor, uh, Samara Klein was amazing. Um, and I'm working with some of the marketing people who are just fantastic. And um, it's, just, it's just been, and this is a very personal story. So to actually see it, just on paper, um, in, in book format is, is very moving for me. Okay, so now is a good time to give a shout out to the illustrator and show us a, a few double spreads. Sure. So the illustrator is Sally Walker, who is also in England. Um, and I've never met her, unfortunately, but I mean, her, her work is just stunning. Um, so this is the cover. The colors are amazing. And, and one of the things I love is how she conveys emotion in her work. Um, because to me, this is just, this is an emotional story. It's a fun story, but there's a lot of emotion. Um, and she, this is, um, this is the opening spread. It's a little, I don't know how well you can see, but the colors are just incredible. And you know, there's a lot of this story takes place in a garden. So she really um, captures she evokes a gar you know, the gardens beautifully. And just, um, 
one of my favorite, which one of my favorite pages is actually this one where the little boy and his grandfather mm -hmm. fall asleep together. Mm -hmm. uh, really, yeah. A after the Passover say there. Yeah. But my favorite double spread, which I hope you're going to show, is yeah. the one of the stairs. Uh-huh. Everybody loves the stairs. I love it too. That's kind of that's talk about evocative. Yeah, that's very emotional. So this is a this is a really important turning point in the story. So I don't want to tell you what's happening, I guess. But yes, and, and most of the people who are watching are not watching. They're listening right. to the NBN the podcast. Oh, okay. So they're so, just going to have to run out and buy the book in May. Clearly. Uh, and, and I would say that um, it's, a, it's a book uh, with, with Jewish a, um, elements, but that way it, it's, it's completely universal. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, why does it make me cry? You're the psychologist, Jen. Well, unfortunately, I never got my degree, but I'm going to say... <laughs> that it you know it taps into those very relatable early childhood feelings that we have for, for the people that we love the adults in our life who we love and just the sense of change which can be scary and sad um but also the idea of hope you know that that there's always hope and 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 things can change but you can still and and to what to what extent is this a, a real story about you and your grandfather your zaidi um, yeah and, and the it's, blueberries and yeah so it's it's actually very real um not completely um but pretty much it's so my grandfather really did move i was very close with my grandparents and my grandmother had a they lived they lived about 15 minutes from me um, my grandmother had a tremendous garden uh she grew up in a tenement in williamsburg with very little uh, the child of immigrants who also, you know, couldn't own land where they lived. They came from Bialystok, which is now in Poland, but it was part of Tsarist Russia. And they had this sense, all of my, my great grandparents, that if you could ever own land, if you could manage that, then you should cultivate it. It's very important to cultivate the earth, put good into the earth, nourish it, take out what you need, nourish your family. You know, it's kind of that whole sense of, you know, and, and she wanted to do that. So when she and my grandfather got married and they were fortunate enough to be able to buy a house that had some property and she got, she got going, she got busy planting. So her garden was this incredible place. If she had royal and cherry trees, lilac bushes, um, rows and rows of blueberry bushes. She had a grapevine and she would use- Oh, was all, all this on Long Island? On Long Island, and by the way, blueberries grow remarkably well on Long Island. The the soil is is very good for but it. Is it is it marshy enough? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's so on the North Shore. The North Shore is a little rockier. It's mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So that's where they lived, and um, the soil is kind of acidic, and mm -hmm. it it blueberries do very well. She planted these blueberry bushes. They lasted for you know sixty years until somebody bought the house and ripped them out, which is so sad. But um, so my cousins and I actually used to pick the blueberries off the bushes and just eat them, you know, and she'd be like yelling, Don, they're not ripe yet, stop. But they were good enough. <laughs> and she made grape jam. She, you know, from the grapevine. So anyway, so my, my grandmother passed away before my grandfather and my grandfather lived in the house for a few more years. And then the decision was made to move him across the country to where my aunt lives because the climate was better for time. She had time to spend them and it just seemed like, but I hated and I wasn't little, I was 30. So, but it was those feelings of loss that were so palpable of missing him and, and, and everything that he represented to, you know, my childhood spent in that garden with my grandparents. Um, so I, I needed, as a writer, I needed to process it. And so I, I started just writing things down and it eventually turned into a story. Um, so it's, it's not entirely the same story. Um, and a lot of my time in that garden was spent with my grandmother. My grandfather was usually in the den with his nose in a book, but my grandmother was always outside, planting, shoveling, um, throwing coffee rinds into the, oh, that sounded really Long Island, right, coffee? Um, <laughs> Throwing coffee rinds into the uh, dirt to help fertilize. 
composting. My grandmother was a composter before people were composting. So uh, yeah, so, but that's the story. So then I kind of reimagined the story as I might have experienced it if I were a little child. And I did have a very little child at the time. So I kind of, that was, I, I turned the little child into maybe, a, you know, a little boy because I had a little boy. So um, one of the things that intrigues me, uh, also from my previous life as a scientist and inventor, is where the ideas come from. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the idea of a, the uh, grandfather hanging around for spring, hanging around for summer is wonderful. But what makes the book uh, is when you bring it home at the end when they're sharing this bowl of blueberries. I don't want to give it away too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But even, even if I do, people still have to buy this book. Um, and do you I, remember the moment you had the idea of how to bring the story home? Or did uh, it just, just flash on you? I think it was actually um, just, I had gotten some criticism from part, critique partners that it didn't feel that the ending was a little too sad because originally, you know, he just left. So, you know, what could I do to change that? You know, and, and, and again, in, in real life, I did see my grandfather again. I had to fly to California to do it, but I did it. And I but, remember- but, but, but you invented this ending. Yeah, yeah. There had, to be, um, there had to be some sort of hope at the end and some sort of assurance, reassurance that things were going to be okay. They were going to be different, but they were still going to be okay because when relationships yeah. are important, like this one, you, you, know, you, you do what you can, you, you figure it out. And I also like mm -hmm. that I wanted, I wanted the little boy, Ben, I wanted him to grow a little bit to realize, you mm -hmm. know, it's not necessarily yeah. just me. It's also Zadie. And, you know, maybe I can kind of do something for Zadie also. And so that kind of just came together, which was, which works, I think. I love the ending. It, it works wonderfully. I mean, the ending is a genius. Thank you. And they have the role reversal now of the, of the child being father to the, to the Zadie uh, yeah. over, over a bowl of blueberries. Yeah. And, um, and I, I love the book. Um, I want to bring, go back now to um, to your history and a little bit of psychology. Um, yeah. you, you, you didn't mention your grandfather much and you didn't talk about your father at all. So, yeah, I love my dad. I'm very close with my dad. I actually just did a blog post about my dad. Um, I have great parents. They're, they're um, you know, my dad's not a writer, so he wasn't really, my dad is, is a brilliant math guy. You know, he loves physics, he loves math. Um, so my dad and I spend a lot of time, spent a lot of time and still do um, talking about history. He's a big history buff. So my love of history and people and the things that cause events, um, those are things I've always talked to him about. And I love historical fiction. I, I've always read a lot of historical fiction. I'm working on some historical fiction and um, that comes from him. So yeah, I, I'm very, um, very much influenced by him, just not with the writing so much. And my grandpa who, you know, inspired this book, like I said, he, it's funny because, so I, I had four grandparents that lived pretty close to me most of my life. My, one of my grandmothers passed away very young, but my grandfather remarried and I had a wonderful step-grandmother. Um, but the, the grandfather who this book is kind of based on is probably the one I had the least close relationship with, not for any reason other than he, he ran a business and he worked a lot. And when he was home, like I said, he was, he would love to see us lots of kisses. How are you? And then he went back to his book because he was relaxing on the weekend. But when my, but, and my but, but Jen, Jen, it's all okay. You know, when you're writing fiction, yeah, you don't have to write the truth. No, no. But what's interesting is my grandmother also never stopped talking ever, ever. She just, you know, would plaster you to the wall with her, her talking. So he didn't really have a chance to say much. So when she passed away, which was horrible, you know, I was very close with her. Um, I started visiting him every week, just me and him. And that's when this connection really solidified. 
And so I, by the time he passed away, I felt very close with him. And I'm grateful for that time that I had with him. It was very poignant in the story when the house is sold. Yeah. It's a poignant moment. Um, so we're coming towards the end of our wonderful interview. And um, there's something that I don't get, Jen. Um, you know, you're, you're wonderful. You're a great writer. Um, you know, you've had this wonderful childhood and, um, and life and you've raised a family and uh, four grandparents and two wonderful parents. Uh, but aren't writers supposed to write through pain and angst? What am I missing here? We all have pain and angst. We all have issues. We all have loss. I've had a lot of loss. Um, and when my, I think one of the things that uh, picture books did for me when I was very young, when I was four, my mother was very, very ill and she was in the hospital for a long time. And the library was, I didn't realize it at the time, but it was something of a, you know, a respite for me. I had these two great aunts bouncing back and forth, taking care of us. So that, um, I think the library and books always made me feel safe. And, um, you know, my mother recovered, so she's fine. But, you know, things like kind, that. Kind, I mean, kind of horror, as the Jews say. Kind of horror, yeah. <laughs> yes, poo poo. So my, um, yeah, I mean, and we've all had things. Look, adolescence is hard. We all go through things. Um, but I think less so pain. It's more like writing to figure out what's happening and to make sense of things that are going on in one's life. And I do a lot of that trying to kind of parse out what's happening and why people do what they do and make the decisions that they do. And, um, you know, this blogging that I've been doing is, is a series that I'm calling mining memories. So I'm kind of digging into memories that I've had that may have influenced my writing um, or perhaps will influence future stories. Um, but I realize as I kind of go back and think about those things, how palpable those, those recollections are and how deep they impact me. <clears throat> and so I think that's, you know, we don't always know what we're writing about, um, but we, we do it anyway. So, yeah. And sometimes it's just for fun. We just enjoy, like, sometimes I just enjoy what I'm writing and I laugh and I'm having fun with the stories that I'm reading. Oh, Maybe I'm think, the only one. I might be no, the only I, one. No, no. I, I, <laughs> this is, I, I really believe in this, that if you're writing something mm -hmm. and it amuses you, that doesn't mean it's going to amuse everybody else. Right, right. But, but the reverse is, if it doesn't amuse you, it's not going to amuse anybody else. Right. I think right. that you, I, 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 I really believe that especially with picture books, we write, I wouldn't say to amuse ourselves, but to work something out with our four or five-year-old. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's my true. belief, but you know, I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> and me neither. Yeah, and you don't, have a, you don't have a degree, so you know. I don't have a degree. Much to my machine's dismay, I have yeah, no degree. Yeah, we're, we're on even ground here. We can talk psychology, you know, all night. Right, <laughs> exactly. So um, do, you want, do you want to say anything about, um, do you have any books that are cooking? You have an agent. Um, I have an agent. Is anything cooking that we should know about? No, not yet. I'll definitely let you know, hopefully, at some point. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I'm just going to say thank you for your wonderful gift of this beautiful, beautiful picture book. Thank Until you. the blueberries grow, published by PJ Library, and that's a feat in itself. And um, yeah. I wish you the best of luck. Uh, thank you. you are a wonderful, candid soul, and uh, you touched all my. Uh, all the right interview buttons from my point of view. Okay. Thank you uh, so much. And, um, and let us know when you have more books coming out. Uh, yeah. If they are young adults with death and sex and I don't know what, I'm not going to interview you because that's, you know, that's, that's not, not your jam. Yeah. It's not my, it's not my thing. Uh, yeah. but, but bring, bring more blueberries to the table. Thank you. Thank you. I will certainly try. And so, thank you so much for hosting me. It was an Jennifer, honor. Jennifer Wolf Cam.
or Gen Cam. Uh, okay. It was wonderful having you. And I'm Mel Rosenberg for the Children's Literature Channel of New Books Network. And this has been a bowl of blueberries. Thank you. So uh, happy Passover to all of you who are uh, celebrating. Um, and if not, then Ramadan Karim uh, and uh, happy uh, Pascha or Easter. Um, and uh, if you don't believe in anything, that's okay too. Just have a happy, happy. Yes. And Jen, it's been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Look how much fun I had. Look at the idiotic smile on my face. Thanks so much, dear. <laughs> thank you.